Sounds great. All righty. So, uh, yeah, Kevin Fennell is my name. Been with Lansing Gear for 22 years. And I'm going to be sharing a perspective um, that we haven't really gotten into on in this uh, two day session so far. And um, when I was in high school, I hated history. I uh, thought that it was a waste of my time to memorize dates. I was going to forget the day after the test, but uh, I am going to go through a historical discussion because I think it's going to help set the stage here um, for for the rest of the presentation. So I, I'm giving you a perspective here of 100 years of metering. So uh, the round meter that we have on our homes today in the US uh, it was actually um, envisioned between 1910 and 1920 by ANSI uh, committee, ANSI C12, came up with a specification for what we have used for 100 years as a round meter. And the reason why we needed a standard is we needed to be able to plug it into an S-based socket at any premise and make sure that uh, if it was a single phase service, it was a form 2S to accommodate that voltage. And then, you know, apartment buildings have slightly different voltage, uh, 12208. So they end up with a 12S and commercial gets a 9S and 16S. So basically it's a, you know, a physical standard and it's a, and, and it's a, a situation where safety is a must for the installer and for longevity. So we built these induct induction disc meters, used them for 50 years. Uh, in some cases without even replacing them. They're originally designed for at least a 30 year life and utilities um, set up a you know, a financial model based off of that. So they appreciated them on a 30 year schedule and everybody was, was happy and really not motivated to change until about 1990. Uh, we started as an industry to use solid state metering for commercial and industrial applications and what drove that was just enhanced feature sets for things like uh, harmonic analysis power quality analysis and um, low profile data and storage and and uh, four quadrant metering so it was accepted that um, for commercial and industrial you had to have a solid state meter and they started putting you know phone lines connecting phone lines to them putting in cell cards and then come around 2000, um, there was a debate about using these solid state meters for residential use. They really were, weren't the drivers uh, that existed for CNI for power quality. And so it was received with a lot of pushback. Uh, I remember being at a EEI meeting in Minneapolis in about 1999. Um, a number of uh, utilities represented all arguing um, that, you know, they couldn't justify a solid state meter. This life was going to be far less than 30 years. And when you put a meter in an environment um, for that long, that is subjected to high fault currents and high ambient temperatures, you know, they really doubted that the price point of a residential meter would be reliable when you when you built it as a solid state meter. So even though that pushback existed, um, I think what sort of took it over the edge was the AMI um, vendors started coming light at that point. Um, and they really drove migration to solid state metering because when they started putting um, the print circuit board assemblies in induction disc meters, they had to like paint the disc black watch the disc bin with LEDs. It was it was a very um, prone to failure. So high fallout. So eventually um, between the AMI vendors and the meter vendors, they transitioned to solid state and all stopped manufacturing in about 20, 2005. So um, the next phase at, at that point was AMI. So AMI advancement was just starting and the there was two states that be, became very active at that point, um, Texas and California. So the commissions in both of those states decided that they wanted to standardize 
what the AMI enabled meter would be, uh, the, the term smart meter be, was born. And I participated myself with the Texas initiative, spent about two years with the, with the utilities and the commission going through the standards. And we defined the smart meter for Texas. And just to sum it up, it was essentially um, about four features that were important. It had to have hourly interval data capability. So this was a total change from, you know, monthly reads really all we really cared about for residential at the time. It had to have an integrated disconnect switch. This was a big move forward. Uh, at that time, if you wanted to have remote disconnect capability, you bought a caller, um, which was either a cellular or uh, like a one-way RF, uh, maybe an RF mesh, but you bought a caller that would live um, behind the meter and it would, it was cost of well over a hundred dollars and it would it would only be on the homes that didn't pay their bills so if someone got one they knew oh i got a caller now the utility is going to disconnect me so it wasn't well received in that regard and california was really the one that pushed it first they said hey we gotta we gotta put a disconnect in every meter and we gotta get that price point down far enough so texas followed suit said you had to have a disconnect and then they also decided that home area networking wanted you know they wanted to support engagement of the consumer and California start that initiative with requiring Zigbee and, and, and Texas followed suit. So now we had two major states deploying high volumes of smart meters that had Zigbee. So that became the de facto standard for the rest of the uh, United States. And to this day, we still put a disconnect in Zigbee in every smart meter. And I would say about 90% of meters shipped today uh, or in the US have uh, has that functionality at a minimum. So, so now we're up to 2020 and uh, the meter that you're getting today, like off the shelf, brand new shiny meters are AMI enabled um, and haven't really evolved a great extent from what they were in 2005 once those requirements came into being. So I'm gonna focus the rest of this presentation on getting us in a mindset to try to predict what this is going to look like, what this meter is going to look like in 2040. Um, it, we've gotten 100 years with a round meter, and I'm willing, I would, I would bet uh, that in 2040, um, if you hire a brand new engineer out of college, and he gets his first job at a utility, and he walks in the door, and you know, when utilities always have these uh, sort of like museums with old electronics, old meters, old transformers. There's going to be a round meter on the shelf, and he's going to ask what that is. I, I really believe that's where we're headed. So how how is that going to happen? So back to the public utilities commission. So at this point in time, I just took a look at a state that's that's active again, like Texas, and and California were 15 years ago, and, and New York is, is one of them. So if you go on New York's uh, PUC site, you'll see a definition of a smart meter. And on the right here, I have um, you know, three main points that I, that I wanna discuss that I see in this definition. One being that measurement needs to be um, not only hourly, but down to one minute intervals. Um, so they're they're starting to think about the fact that uh, you, you were going to be using this data coming from this meter for far more than revenue purposes. You don't necessarily need that level of granularity for revenue applications. The next being the, the higher resolution of the data, the more valuable the cost to the customer and the utility. So the commission is focusing on both the utility and the customer here, which is great. And they're saying that the resolution of the data is important to both of those entities. So meters today with AMI are going to deliver, you know, they're 0.2% accurate and typically measure power down to one watt. And they have never really focused on doing, you know, sampling at a, a a rate necessarily high enough to get 
like signature analysis or waveform capture capability in a meter. Uh, but there are many use cases that they, both the customer and the utility can benefit from by adding that functionality. And it seems New York is, 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 is trying to help the industry move that way. And then the last is more of an economical point they made is that um, the a smart meter should allow third parties to market energy information and management services or to market uh, both energy information management services. So this is this is in line with um, Texas, who really pushed retail you know energy providers and uh, opened up their market 15 years ago. And New York is following suit by saying, you know, that we do have to enable exchange of energy uh, by third parties. You know, homeowners are going to want to sell their power to the utility. They might want to sell their power to the neighbor. So the smart meter has to, to help with that initiative. So to get change, I'm going to go back to standardization. Uh, you know, we talked about how ANSI came out with the standard we're following in 1910 to 1920. Um, ANSI is the governing body for ANSI is the National Electric Manufacturers Association. They have endorsed ANSI as the certification body that can create the standards um, that the utility industry follows. And they, they uh, obviously have a lot of participation from both vendors and utilities uh, that can motivate the change over time, um, but they're going to be highly influenced by the communication that's in the meter as well. That's why I've represented IEEE. So IEEE has um, created a ANSI standard 802.15.4G, which is endorsed at the national level as the RF mesh standard for um, the smart smart utility network being any private or publicly or privately owned utility network that would function not only as an AMI network, but um, potentially as a DA network and also communicate with other IoT applications, be it smart meters or, or street lights, but all operate under a field area network that is interoperable as long as they follow 802.15.4G standard. And if you think about Wi-Fi and how versatile that is, it is a 802.11 standard, and um, the Y Sun Alliance did some good marketing and put a, a we on the sun, and now we got Y Sun, and they are the self-proclaimed certification body that vendors need to go to to get certified as a Y Sun compliant um, product. And just like when you buy a device that's going to connect to your router at home, you can buy an IoT smart grid device and they connect um, under your field area network that you've invested in. And finally, there is um, a lot of traction with using cellular uh, in the utility market for communication to meters and, and distribution automation and, and IoT applications as well. And these are governed by 3GPP. It's a global initiative for broadband or mobile device broadband communication. And so all of our, you know, 3G to 4G to LTE, LTE, 5G, all that migration is standardized by this body. So they are obviously all need to align. Um, to make sure that whatever we deliver in the end is going to be, uh, you know, operational from both the communication metering and consumer engagement utility operations perspective. And I think the utilities will, some utilities will decide to own this communication network and some will decide to uh, invest in it and either buy or, or to use a public carrier and operate over a public, you know, Verizon or AT&T service with their cellular. So the next topic I wanted to get into is to look at the consumers aspect here. So um, we've got a historical um, situation in the United States of 
consumers really not being engaged with the utility, especially not worrying about their meter. Uh, most people don't know where the meter is or don't look at it and hardly look at their utility bill. And efforts to try to get those customers to engage, such as uh, putting them on time and use rates, um, were cumbersome. Uh, you had to promote them, you know, do some promotion to get the customers to sign up. You had to have a TOU enabled meter before AMI that had to have a battery. Um, you know, you had to have a separate program. Your meter shop had to have a TOU meter and a non TOU meter, and the rate group had to know which one was which. And so there, there was, it was a cumbersome effort um, if you did, were able to sign someone up. Uh, AMI made that a little bit easier, um, eliminated the battery, but it sort of even complicated it because now you had to maintain meter programs for both meters as well as like an AMI profile for both types of meters. So along comes more data collection. So once you get five minute data, one minute data, 15 minute data, you know, 15 minute is basically the standard right now for all um, smart meters. Um, you can do all that calculation up at the enterprise layer and effectively offer time-based rates and real-time rates and peak price, you know, peak uh, demand price um, for even a residential customer. And I wanted to take a look at one, one of our customers in Arizona. So this is in obviously the most, you know, prevalent area for solar generation in the United States, um, much higher than um, any other region. And they've taken a very um, creative approach at their customers. So when you go on the website, um, they give you some options. You know, you can be a time use customer, peak demand, a demand to you, or you could just be basic. Uh, they make it sound sort of basic. Uh, I would say that uh, probably 95% of us are basic. And uh, uh, you might just think, well, I, you know, I'm investing in solar panels and I just got an EV and I don't want to be basic. I want to take advantage of demand TOU rates so I make sure I'm at the lowest cost of energy uh, when I'm charging my vehicle. And I mean, throughout this session, we've heard a lot of programs focused on, on charging stations, both public and private. Um, listen to arguments that private may be very prevalent. Uh, so homeowners need to prepare for charging their vehicles at home and offering these types of options for them um, is really important. And so the meter needs to be a, a part of this by giving the granularity of the data necessary. So now I'm going to move more into the grid focus. So if I am a person at a utility uh, that's responsible for the integrity of my transmission and distribution grid, and I'm sitting in this forum over the last two days hearing us vendors and, and progressive utilities talking about all the cool stuff they've done. This is what's going through my head. I'm like, oh my God, you know, I, I work at a utility and I guess from my personal perspective, I started at a nuclear power plant when I was fresh out of college and our job was to keep the power plant running. I mean, we only shut it down 42 days a year. Um, and we, as soon as we turned it back on, we, we spent the rest of the year planning for how we're going to make the next 42 days shut down most, most efficient. And this vertically integrated grid did not require um, dynamic voltage regulation, introduction of, of uh, batteries along the grid to add stability. Um, people wanted to put in solar panels and wind turbines um, on the end of a distribution line that's got, you know, single phase small copper wire serving it. So the uh, the smart meter, believe it or not, um, can help this, these people try to sleep better at night. And I'm gonna, to, to put this in perspective, I wanted to start with uh, just a, a simple use case um, that I think will paint the picture for you. So about 25, 30 years ago, uh, utilities started using fault indicators and they would put these out on the line and they would turn from like black to orange when a fault occurred. 
and they, they'd be up on the median voltage between 4 kV and 35 kV. So fault occurs, Lyman drives out. They see it's orange here. Okay, I know the fault was beyond this point. Um, it just helped them try to narrow down where that fault was and restore the power. Then we got a little smarter and we started putting counters on them. And now only could you identify faults, but you can identify the number of them. So now the distribution group drives around in the truck, gets out, takes binoculars out, looks at the counter, writes it down, and goes back, talks to their planning group and says, oh, we've got, you know, most outages are on Highway 65. That's where we should spend our $2 million on tree trimming this year. And everybody thought that it was the most innovative thing ever. And along comes AMI, puts a communication medium in the, in the sensor. Now, it, or the fault indicator, now it becomes a sensor. It's able to capture not only that there were faults, how many faults, but also give you waveform capture and signature analysis. You now know if it was a tree trimming or a tree event that caused it. You know if it was an animal or a bird. You know if it was a, you know, a transformer failure. You can identify faulty insulators, be more preventative or do preventative maintenance. So this device just became extremely valuable by, you know, combining the communications with the sensing capability, and it has very high um, processing power to do that signature, signature analysis. So once you bring that level of processing power into the meter, you've now essentially put these sensors at every home. Um, so you can bring this data back and analyze it at the enterprise layer and make very good decisions for you know planning and preventative maintenance for operations. It also helps you decide um, if you really can put a you know a, a two megawatt solar load that a neighborhood wants to put in um, where they're located and how that's going to affect the, the grid once it once it becomes operational. So moving on to the ultimate question I raised at the beginning of the presentation, what is the meter going to look like in 2040? Uh, I would argue that it could look like this. Um, we don't know what it's going to look like, right? So let's go down this path a little bit. Uh, what is the purpose of the meter? So the, we, we have meters that are owned by utilities, essentially. Um, in every state. There's been just some debate about letting the retail electric providers own them, but the, the thought is that this is the demarcation point between the utility grid and the home homeowner's grid or commercial, you know, industry's grid. So the utility should own it and control it, and it serves a very important role as a demarcation point. So we, go ahead. We, um, Oh, must, must be someone that took, got off mute. So it, so it serves a very important role as a demarcation point. And um, there's, there's discussion about, well, you really can move this metrology functionality down to things within the home. Well, uh, first thing you can do is you can put it in the service panel. You know, you can you can make the service panel main be a main meter, and then put a meter in every one of the every one of the circuit breakers. You're monitoring each load. You could put a meter in the EV charger, a meter in the pool pump. Um, that's all theoretically possible. I guess I would argue that that's still overkill. Um, the Putting a meter in each device has been something the utilities have done uh, for use cases like load control for hot water heating or baseboard heating. Um, utilities have put the meter, actually put in a second meter for those applications in some states. And right now, uh, some utilities are putting in a second meter for the EV charger. And there's a lot of work being done on trying to put a meter in the EV charger, and then everyone argues about, you know, what's revenue grade metering and who owns the meter. Um, so the the option of making the meter smarter is a very interesting path. So if you put more intelligence in the meter itself, um, it can actually sample 
at a high enough rate to, lo to do load disaggregation, okay? So you can actually identify the loads within the home, such as all your appliances, even solid state co components like TVs, um, with the help of um, a customer entering in some information about their, their products. Um, so you can learn um, what's on at what time, you know, what, when's the EV charger on. All that can be done at the metering point. Uh, and then it can still function as the demarcation point. And, and then just think about the physical connection. It should connect to the solar panel um, so that it can monitor the energy usage being generated or the energy usage and the energy generation from that home. Uh, and it should be also able to be smart enough to control the chargers within the home, you know, charge up all the batteries that you own at the lowest rate so that you can sell power back to your neighbors. Um, when you go to work, if they stay at home, for instance. So, at Lanniston Gear, we don't have the answer. We're not making a meter that looks like this right now. Um, what we have to do as, together is work with our commissions at each at each state. Um, this is we're all in this together um, to figure out where to move this this meter so that it's not the round meter anymore. Um, and Interesting. I'm going back in history again. Um, this was in 1998, and if I was talking to my kids right now, I would say back in the late 1900s. My wife and I like to uh, mess with them and uh, talk that way when we talk about something that's more than 20 years ago. But so here I am, 1998. I started at an AMI company, a lot of utility into an AMI company. And the head of the company is like this crazy inventor, Einstein looking guy. And it's right when this IEEE or IEEI meetings were trying to decide whether or not to do solid state metering. So his, his idea is, yeah, we're going solid state metering in a big way. We're gonna take the register off of it. It's just gonna be a nice sleek, you know, device that you plug in. It's still got the S-base socket because there's no way you can get around that. But we're gonna make this thing any color you want. So if you've got a you know nice blue siding, it's going to be blue. If you've got a brick house, we're going to put a brick pattern on there. Sounds pretty cool. So goes to the major meter vendors and tells them about it. Goes to some large utilities, discuss it. Basically, everyone laughed them out of their their office. And and at the time, I was fresh out of the utility. I thought it's pretty crazy myself. I'm like you can't do that. The PUC says you have to have a register on it. Well. When I look back, the guy wasn't really that crazy. Um, we we probably could have got away without the registers for the last 20 years, and we'd all have nice nice meters on our homes. But um, the the point being that if we're going to change things, we got to do it together, and uh, we can we can make that happen. And I've I've got one final thought I want to walk through before we start answering questions. So. This is a house in Pres Prescott, Arizona. Uh, the locals say you're supposed to say Prescott and some say you're supposed to say Prescott. So I can't claim I know how to pronounce the city, but it's in Arizona. And uh, my wife and I were able to stay in this home for a week last October. Uh, it is a total off the grid home. Uh, friends of ours built it as their second home. and even though it looks like it's in a national forest, uh, this is actually in the city limits of, of Prescott and they had an extremely difficult time getting zoning and permits to build this because it's off grid. Uh, it's, it's the first off grid home and the city and utilities didn't really know how to deal with it. Um, it's, so the, I admit this is somewhat of a modest home. It's about 1400 square feet, only really in room comfortable. It's very comfortable for two people. All the luxuries of home, you know, HVAC, all elect electric appliances, some some gas, but mostly electric even. Um, so this battery storage area on the right is, is is providing all that power. Solar arrays only about 12 feet by 40 feet. You can see it there on the right, and then the battery house right next to it. And then for the battery house, it runs over to an inverter on the back side of the home, which you can't see right now underneath a really beautiful deck. 
and that inverter is quiet enough or you don't really even notice know it's there and so their experience was they had to fight the utility to even be able to zone this um, from my vantage point they would the utility lost an opportunity to work with this customer to connect the home uh, the utility could have purchased power from them while they were away because it is a second home all that power they're generating when they're not there could have been sold to the utility and, and vice versa the utility could be their backup power provider uh, they did they have had an instance where uh, they had extended cold weather where they did um, run out of power for for a period of time so that would have been nice at that point so we the utilities do need to do what, what's possible to embrace um, the customer of the future uh, one interesting um, stat i found was from the international energy agency they predict that by 2030 off-grid energy systems are the cheapest option for 70 percent of rural users so i mean you can take this with a grain of salt this is international looking at third world you know development and obviously an off the grid home is going to be the best option follows the cellular path um you know these homes never got landlines they started with cell phones so so the um there's obviously going to be a proliferation of off grid homes but in the US we're pretty energy we're pretty much energy hogs at the moment um i mean many homes are up to 320 amps and they have multiple air conditioners in some cases, especially in uh, where where our office is located down in Georgia. That's where uh, pretty much everyone's got. So those kind of homes will never be totally off the grid, but you can imagine they're going to be very motivated to have battery storage and EVs, and we have to figure out how to enable all that to happen. So with that, I would like to uh, open up for Q and A. I cannot see the questions myself. Hey, Kevin. Uh, yeah, if you click on the chat bubble, um, you can see where folks are typing in questions. If you have a question for Kevin, uh, please do type it into the chat area there on the on the right. <clears throat> Thanks very much for your presentation, uh, Kevin. It was very, very interesting. Um, one question here, uh, is, the, uh, is the coming of 5G slash edge computing uh, going to make for a different or greater role uh, for intelligence in the residential meter. Uh, that is to say some kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence application being utilized to you know, optimize network performance or, or create new services. What do you see as the, you know, I guess what you, that question is, what, what do you see as the role of the future, meter of the future in light of, of these applications that are go along with 5G and, and machine learning. What, what's your thoughts along those lines? Yeah, I would, I would say that the biggest advantage of the migration to 5G is opening up the potential for uh, media, you know, machine to machine communication over that medium so that each one of those smart meters wouldn't have to go directly to a tower instead they they would potentially mesh it to an extent but i think the more valuable thing is that they can talk to each other and do some localized learning um, this is already being accomplished in the uh, the wi networks and, I, and it's going to happen as well in the 5g networks so at that point um, it's even more of a justification for putting more processing power in the meter itself so that the meter can make localized decisions with its with its neighboring meters and lower the burden of sending all that data up to some enterprise application to make those decisions. Also engaging the consumers uh, devices into those decisions. So yeah, the 5G is, is definitely going to help. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, were you advising that demand charges for residential consumers was recommended for utilities? And if so, could you restate why you think that is? 
Yeah, so demand charges for residential. So the um, the thought behind it is that you know the use case of the neighborhood that has five Teslas and still only has a 25 kVA pad mount transformer doesn't work. So the utilities struggle with how am I going to help the consumer help themselves so that I don't have to put in 125 kVA transformer and then socialize that cost because that's how it's set up right now against all the other all the other people that aren't buying EVs. Um, there's got to be you know a way to rationalize it. Um, the more you can provide incentive to the residential user to control their demand, um, the easier that equation becomes. It doesn't totally solve it, but it starts giving you the option to have them think about the impact they're doing to the to the grid. Patty, did you have a follow up on that? Uh, yeah. Um, I well, no, I I guess I I'd like to take it offline because I well, yeah. Let me just say that. As the industry transitions to beneficial electrification or electrify everything, whatever you want to call it for carbon emissions reductions, the idea that a demand charge fee added to a residential user um, is a good thing would uh, is not borne out by the research because our research shows consumers don't like demand charges and when they get added to a tariff that they um, decline time of use or time varying rate plans. And research also shows that demand charges harm low income and low use consumers. So if you want to smooth out demand, there's a lot better ways to do it. Most likely time of use, basic time of use plans, which to be honest, the smart meters never took advantage of as I expected them to 10 years ago when they were presented as a solution to a lot of problems, most namely peak demand. And now, you know, 10 years in or more, less than 7% of consumers are on a time of use plan. So that's really the place to start. But I have a lot more information I can share with Kevin later. We, I, I just wrote an essay on this that published in Monday's Utility Dive, if anyone wants to take a look at it where I'm laying out the case that demand charges are inappropriate for residential consumers for the reason I just gave, but also because they don't understand them. And we don't want to penalize consumers for transitioning to electrification, which a demand charge is viewed as a penalty by consumers. Yeah, that, that that's interesting point. I, I believe TLU definitely goes a long way to help the, the EV use case. Uh, and I think that, you know, Tucson, um, Arizona is taking definitely a uh, proactive approach here, which isn't being followed by every state by any means. And if you notice on their website, they make that a choice. So people are choosing which of those four options and they don't need to choose the peak demand option. Um, however, you know, so they're not forced into it. Um, but what they're doing is giving them incentives to try to get them to use it. Um, and it, it just comes down to trying to manage the, uh, the impact to the grid as, as more and more um, EVs come online. I think the, the best, I mean, the best way that the, the homeowner can help is to really manage their energy storage and, um, and, and get incentive um, to the extent possible to add more batteries and the, so you optimize their investment in solar. I think that the, you know, the investments in solar aren't matched by the investment in the battery technology. Um, and the car batteries were not envisioned to be a source of, of uh, reserve power for the home. However, there's no reason they can't be. So that, I think that is going to help with, with this peak demand, you know, issue that we're going to have. Kevin, have you looked into um, the rate of rooftop solar plus storage now, as opposed to even a few years ago? Because I understand it's more, it's happening like in much higher numbers, but I don't know 
what those are. If you've looked into that, I'd be interested to know how that's changed in the last few years. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have any official numbers. I think that the market is there. I mean, uh, I mean Tesla's done a great job of marketing a battery that you put in your in your home. I think that has had an effect on it, but I don't see that peg moving very much yet. Okay, thank you. Brian, I'm gonna unmute you if you wanna do your, you had, I think you had a follow-up question for Kevin. Just um, wondering, uh, do you view the um, role of the meter as sort of migrating to be a more general data acquisition device um, and including some built-in uh, sensor capability? For not only electricity, but maybe other things. Uh, yeah, that's definitely the view that the the meter is becoming a, a much more important part of the uh, the grid than it ever has, and the fact that it's delivering you know billable data is is the least of its jobs in the future. So yeah, the reason the reason I'm uh, the reason I'm pointing it out is because. Um, in terms of energy usage, a lot more um, uh, capability is uh, being accredited to articulating the energy for purposes of modulating it as opposed to, you know, simple shutting it on and off and, and basic metering. So being able to um, um, articulate it at a, a, a finer level of granularity is uh, uh, becoming more important for you know, mitigation of uh, uh, kind of grid uh, influence variability, you know, load shaping, uh, as well as uh, at the economics at the at the user end. Yeah, I would agree. Kevin, for this uh, um, for this uh, case study that you have here for the meter of the future, this off grid uh, house that was built, um, could you? Could you clarify again what the role of the meter is uh, for a place like this that's not even connected to the grid? I think you may have covered it, but I, I don't know if I quite understood what that was. Uh, my, my point was that obviously there is no meter here and there could have been. Um, so the, 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 the meter should have been there if, if the utility would have worked with the customer and the, and the, and the role of the meter is to provide just like the New York Commission said, provide that customer with the ability to do market transactions. So let this this home sell their power to the utility or to other consumers when they're not there or when they have excess capacity and also to take advantage of, of uh, maybe they wanna buy power from someone else sometimes or be emergency backup from the utility. So I, that's where I see the meter doesn't go away um, unless, um, we don't embrace these these types of homes because more and more homes are going to become self-sufficient i don't know that they'll ever be totally self-sufficient but they have the ability to do it now so i mean the worst thing that happens is you don't have meters um, um and maybe that's ultimately good but i mean I, that's not going to happen for for some time see so utilities uh are you aware of, of uh, any utilities that are more receptive to this kind of off-grid deployment going forward? <clears throat> and uh, is there an attitude change going on in, in terms of willingness to work with these kind of projects? And do you see this as a, as a growing trend or is this kind of deployment kind of a one-off uh, interesting project? You know, I asked because of the statistic from the IEA that you shared that, um, you know, off-grid systems really is gonna be a cheap, uh, attractive option for a lot of rural users by 2030. So, I mean, do you see utilities as, you know, getting warmer to this? Uh, yeah, definitely in Arizona, uh, we work with um, Tucson Electric Power, Salt River Project and Arizona Public Service. Every one of them are, are very active in supporting um, distributed generation. Uh, in some cases, they even own the, the solar panels on top of the customers home, they put in the inverter and then they manage the usage for them. And so, yeah, they're, they're really supportive of, of generation. Now taking it to off the grid, I guess from a utility standpoint, they don't 
necessarily want to lose customers to off the grid. But what Arizona is doing is they're embracing the, the distributed generation to ensure that those customers still see value um, from the from the um, utility owned grid. Thanks. Although Dan, I wanted to comment on the off grid. Um, uh, there are some people looking at off grid as not necessarily um, necessarily divorcing yourself from the utility, especially if the utility still owns the off grid equipment and services it for you. <clears throat> so it's a bit like uh, renting versus owning an RV. <laughs> uh, David, I'm going to call on you <laughs> to see if you have any thoughts you'd like to share on this uh, topic. Um, I know you've been listening and, 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 and I just wanted to see if you had any uh, other questions for Kevin or any comments you wanted to share with us. Let me make sure you're unmuted here. Sorry, I'm you're can, you, okay. can you hear me? Yeah. Well, yep. thank you. Thanks. Yeah. No. This is this was fascinating, and the the whole idea of of not only what the meter is going to look like and the function it performs, but it appears that you know in, in discussions that we've been having, you know, on this topic regarding particularly, um, you know, what what kinds of controls do you need? It's you know, and there was discussed made of five G, but even beyond that, how do you how do you send you know, qualified uh, and, and cyber secure signals uh, to these meters and collect this data that's necessary coming back and who's going to own that data? Uh, where's where's it going to be stored? Um, and how is that going to be benefiting, you know, the customer in the end? They're, they're putting in a lot of devices now and that meter needs to be able to distinguish, there was a mention made of that, of, of the signals in order to differentiate what what appliance or, or service is being used at what point in time and what level of control can you have over it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's the value that the customer is going to see, you know, you know, in that meter. I know, you know, Kevin mentioned, you know, who's going to own it. I, I think the utility, in my mind, the utility has to continue to always own it because that's besides kind of being the, the measurement, it, it also is a way of certifying what is actually being generated and transmitted back and forth you know, between to that household. And so there has to be some accountability for that. Um, I think if a third party owned it, it would be difficult to to ensure the accuracy, you know, of it unless we have more standards. And I think we have enough of those already. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess just to answer the initial question from at this point, the utilities are still owning the assets. They're still owning the security portion of this. So uh, typically the utility will, purchase the security appliances necessary to maintain integrity over the communication medium, whether it's cellular or RF mesh. Um, they, they may already even have those appliances in place that they just utilize over these networks. And the fact that the networks are, you know, true interoperable IP networks, um, the IT of the, of the um, utility typically has that capability. So I, I see security being addressed, but it's utility owned um, uh, enterprise that's doing it. Yeah, totally agree. Um, yeah, you just alluded to the fact about who who kind of begged the question of who's that, who's going to own it, and I just didn't see that, you know, changing going forward. But um, yeah, the, yeah, but that's, that's a real good point. The other the other kind of question that that arises here is that is the granularity of what that information needs to be, right? The meters are getting more and more sophisticated with much more granularity, which is necessary for to monitor everything at the grid edge. Um, uh, but the question is, when is enough going to be enough of of that granularity? Just because of the data volumes that have to then be collected, and is there true is there true value in getting to that level of granularity? And and whose value is it going to be? Yeah, and yeah. So the there's typically a process of bringing back 15 minute data at this point. Uh, even though the meters can bring back you know 16 channels of that data, utilities aren't storing all of it. They may store the the deliver and receive kilowatt hour, hour only you know two channels of it for five years. You know, so there's decisions made about what what data you're gonna store and what you're not going to store. An operations department 
um, like may take advantage of the voltage and current data that's coming in those LP channels, but you're going to send that maybe to a data lake that they're going to access. So um, the utilities on their own are deciding how to manage that data um, and whether or not they want to host it or pay someone else to, you know, to host it in a, in a centralized uh, data warehousing application, because some of it isn't necessarily confidential um, and can be stored that way. Some of it obviously has to be stored um, at the utility, so, or at, at least under utility uh, ownership, so. Dan, this is a perfect setup for what we're going to be talking about at 215. I'm going to show you a system that's owned by the utility that has second by second, watt by watt data continuously. You know, and, and I was thinking when I asked that question, uh, Gary, the, the thing that was in the back of my mind is, you know, we need a certain amount of granularity to monitor, to manage now the grid at the grid edge um, because of the variance in the, in the technologies that are now being installed there and how, how they operate, and what frequencies and such. I think we're going to need a lot more visibility, but with that comes a lot of cost potentially and, and controls and questions of ownership. And, you know, I'm, I'm beginning to work a lot in this whole area of transactive energy, which is all, you know, household to household or circuit to circuit kind of chain, you know, transactions that are going to be occurring. And I could see where that would be necessary in order to balance things at that level where before it wasn't needed by the utility uh, to, to balance the grid. Yeah. And the paradigm shift of is this is in front of the meter versus behind the meter. So all your resources and DERs are in front of the meter. So it can be owned by the utility and managed by the utility. David, do you see a, a growing trend toward transactive energy, or is it still um, something on the on the drawing board in your in your view? Well, it, it's conceptual, although there's some pragmatic cases of it um, that have been run using blockchain um, as as the mechanism for for conducting them, uh, particularly in Europe. But there's also a case study in Long Island. Uh, doing this, I think it's right now. It's going to be very situational. We'd have to have a lot more penetration of DERS at the grid edge uh, before it becomes uh, necessary or even viable uh, to run that. But I, I, you know, with the pace of of growth that we're seeing, you know, you used to say it could be it could be twenty years out. I'm not sure that it's twenty years out anymore. Um, but there's a lot of things that are happening concurrently here that will help determine how fast that comes to market. Um, but I can definitely see it being in a situational, situ, you know, situ, being, being situational based on the degree of penetration that occurs and the roles and functions that the utility sees itself playing. Um, if it simply wants to be a grid balancing authority, you know, like a DSO, then some of that transactional um, energy uh, kind of concept could could apply at, at the sub regional level. Um, and thereby the utility is only kind of aggregating up. It's almost like hooking up mini microgrids or, you know, that, that kind of concept um, that could be occurring. And there may be reasons why that's that's viable, but those are individual use cases or situations I think that are going to arise. I'm not sure how universal it is at this point. At least I don't have, I don't, I can't envision a use case kind of evolving where that that's going to be the case, but. Right, right. And there's still regulatory, you know, hurdles, obviously. That's right. Just be mindful of how what happened in the banking industry, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, or 20 years ago, I guess. Um, and it was caused by inflation, but inflation uh, caused the rate of banking, the number of banking transactions per unit of time to uh, accelerate uh, tremendously. Uh, but the cost per transaction came down uh, exponentially as well because the the uh, method of uh, performing those transactions was changed to be totally computational and automatic. So it was a, a one-time sort of investment in um, things like uh, automatic tellers and, and uh, big uh, computers and things. So, uh, but you're right, it's the utility, or I shouldn't use that term, I was thinking the small u there. It, it's the um, degree to which you want to um, be aware of of the transactions, the number or the number or type of transactions that uh, probably drive it. Right. And and the more that, as you just indicated, the more the technology can automate that, it becomes a foregone conclusion in a way that you're going to be driving that cost down and 
and it might be more viable to have it at all of that take place at the grid edge. Uh, I mean, the generation's happening there as well as the consumption. Is there a need to, to aggregate the, all of that information and load up to a central clearinghouse that we now define a utility service territory in order to balance all of those um, households and businesses in terms of their, their load needs? You have to kind of look at it sort of as sub-metering almost and, and, and say, you know, is the sub-metering have to be communicated all the way up the hierarchy or... You know, do you just aggregate the information and then just pass on the um, the aggregated result? That's right. So the role, so com coming full, full, you know, full, full cycle, you know, the, the role of that meter becomes really important of playing multiple functions and the granularity of it mm -hmm. is important to the, to the extent that the, that the load you're trying to manage needs that degree of granularity in order to perform its functions. And when that happens, uh, the, the whole role of the meter uh, is no longer essentially premised on tolling, but rather on controlling or articulating. So it changes its primary function. So then it picks up well, a whole bunch of other function and tolling becomes almost like a, a sidebar, uh, which you almost get for free because you want all the other stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, I want to take a 15 minute, maybe 18 minute break before the start of the next session at 2.15 here uh, on uh, Brian's session on uh, grid of grids, mesh network interconnections of neighborhood, community, and regional microgrids. So, Kevin, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you for the Q&A uh, discussion. Very interesting. So, we're going to take uh, about a 15 minute break and be back here at 2.15 for uh, this session right here. Let me click through to it a second. Thank you all for your time today. Really enjoyed this opportunity and chat with y'all. That's the session. So, yes, thank you, Kevin. And uh, we'll, we'll rendezvous back here, uh, same chat room at uh, our WebEx room at, at 2.15, which is about 15 minutes. So thank you. Goodbye. Great job, Kevin. Thank you. Brian, I mean, Bo, are you there? Bo, are you there? Hi, hi, Dan. Uh, this is Bo. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, am I the first? Uh, let me unmute Brian here. Brian, do you want to? You and Gary want to go first, or do you want Bo to go first? I think we decided uh, last time we talked about this, Dan, that it might be better. Uh, I think what uh, Bo's doing builds on what we're doing. Forgot. So you and you and uh, Brian will go first, then we'll and then we'll go into Bo's talk. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll get started in about fifteen minutes. Then. Oh, one thing, uh, Bo. Do you want to just uh, triple check, make sure you can uh, upload your presentation? So I'm passing yeah. the presenter ball to you if you want to try that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'll send you the slides right after uh, the presentation. Okay. Yeah, actually, you would up, uh, share the content yourself from your end. You just uh, click on that up arrow bu bubble there. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay, right. Uh, you, you mean I can share the screen from my side, right? 
Yeah, just click on the share content and then pick the PowerPoint application. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, By the way, Dan, while he's doing that, um, I sent my slides to Brian. So, Brian, we won't have to switch users. Uh, Brian's just folds into mine. Okay, sounds good. Looks good, Bo. I can see that real, real good. Great. Uh, I'll stop. Uh, stop sharing. Okay. Bye. Yeah, I'll I'll give the ball back to Brian in in a little bit here. So, sounds good. I'm going to put y'all on mute. <laughs>